Good evening. Good to see everybody. Everybody back. How many of you run with music? Okay, and that includes me. Um, how many will hardly ever run with music then or not? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Okay, so um, a couple of things. So music, the pros, it can be very helpful. Not only just, you know, sort of on the surface of, hey, I feel better, I like listening to that, that's really good music. Uh, but you can actually get them synced to, you know, your cadence and you can get it synced to your, your uh, strides per minute and, and really keep your pace with music. You know, there's a lot of recommendations. One is obviously never run at a volume that you can't hear traffic, okay? Uh, that's one of the more important ones. And you have to determine what that volume is. A lot of times I see runners, particularly in races, because there's a consideration of other runners, never run at a level where you can't hear, you know, footsteps either. Or someone saying on your left or a cyclist saying on your left, you know, make sure those things you've got to be able to hear. If not, you and I are in the wrong. OK, so we've got to be able to hear that. Some people just wear one ear, ear plug or pod or whatever when they run. That works pretty well. Anybody do that? Oh, OK. Yeah. Do a right or left, whatever it is. Uh, some just adjust the volume. So just just be aware of that. This week, we are week. F oh, that's not right. Was anybody going to correct me? We can do it. Again. We can do it. Oh, we can do it again. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Mr. Phillip. All right. It's actually week four, but I know that's the right workout. Okay. So week four, we are going to do 90 seconds running, 90 seconds walking, and then you get to run for three minutes and walk for three minutes. How many times are we going to do that? One. <laughs> <laughs> We, we were going to do it twice. Nice try. We're going to do that twice. And so by the time we're done, what that's, we've moved up to nine minutes, still moving forward in that speed running. Or if you're walking, if you want to increase the pace at that time. Uh, but we're increasing the amount of time on our feet and the amount of uh, exertion we put on it. So um, they get a little bit crazy for the next several weeks with these sort of intervals. 93 to four, so all of these sort of things. Then we have a couple weeks where they're not the same all the week. Just stay with it, trust the plan, and then we're going to get TPT. TT. -T. Well, I don't even know my own initials. What is it? TT. <laughs> trust the plan. TTP. <laughs> yeah. We'll trust the plan. We're going to trust the plan because at, on the back end of this, the last three weeks or so, it's just going to be, hey, let's go out there for 25 minutes and get at it. Okay, so. This is a real critical part. Also critical, if you've missed some workouts so far, hey, you're good, all right? From here out, that's just, we've really got to dig in. We've got to be committed, okay? Let's just really try to get these in as we move forward through this middle section of the training. All right, two times. We're going to do that. And uh, when we come back in, we are good on the time. We come back in, uh, we are going to be uh, putting you to task at your tables to actually seek and search wisdom and how that's going to build into next week as well. So we'll have a good time back at our tables getting to know one another. But um, let's, um, let's go. That's, <laughs> I start slow. I've got to warm up into my whistle. All right. All right. What a beautiful night. What a beautiful night. Alicia and the Bowens. All right.
and I hope I'm able to share why I believe Job is one of the most impactful uh, books of the Bible, but also messages and meanings and means to endurance and patience and suffering through trials. He, we, we're going to find out how to do that, even if Job wasn't the best at it. And so the next two weeks, I want to introduce you just an overview of Job. And if we have time tonight, I'm going to show you something. Uh, but then next week is always a fun thing, too, during our team time that we, you guys get to be uh, pretty artsy and creative. And everybody plays a part again in, in working out a passage in Job. Uh, it was the last thing we tried the night we shut down for COVID two years ago. So we're going to do it right this year. So I'm looking forward for you guys to be back for that. Now, Job, high level, high level overview. Wisdom books of scripture. We've talked about them. There are six. On most charts, you might see five. And you'll see these right here, right? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. And the reason uh, that you often don't see the sixth one is because it is Lamentations. And Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. And so when the canon was put together in this order, uh, they stuck jam uh, Lamentations next to Jeremiah. And a lot of times our charts aren't real convenient because they're not all grouped together. And we just kind of leave it down there with the prophets because a prophet wrote it. But um, Lamentations joins those five as wisdom books um, of the Bible. We've seen poetry. Okay. We saw poetry. Uh, last week when we talked about Proverbs, we saw the books of Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Job is a true, true wisdom genre. In, in the very definition of ancient Near Eastern wisdom literature is, is where we find Job. And, and what, what I want to tell you about that is that Job has 42 chapters. If you look at the 42 chapters of Job, chapters 1 and 2 are a narrative. Hi, this is Job. <laughs> While jo Job's going about his business down here on earth, uh, the, uh, the council before God, someone gets a little bit high on his horse. His name was Satan. Um, you see where that name is going to lead us. Satan, though, um, really just meant the accuser in Hebrew. So the accuser points to God and says, hey, Job's got it pretty good. Uh, and J God says, yeah, he's pretty righteous. He's a righteous man. He's godly. And, and Satan says, well, I bet he's not righteous when things are stacked against him. And that kind of gets into uh, the, the suffering that then is um, leveled out on Job as a demonstration of, of what might happen. And so we see the narrative. We see the, uh, the loss of family. We see the loss of livestock. We see the, uh, the loss of health, of wealth. And everything else that the earthly, uh, everything else temporal at least. Uh, is lost. And that's the first two chapters. And then immediately the narrative stops. And for the next 39 chapters, chapters 3 through 41, we see straight wisdom. Okay. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to talk you through that slide on the next one. Uh, that's what I want to tell you. Tonight. And then 42, we get back into narrative. Right. And so God restored Job and um, he and Job had learned his lesson. And uh, Job goes about his life narrative, but it's that huge, huge gap. The entirety of Job basically is wisdom. And what I mean by that is that between chapters three and 41, there are three cycles. You remember how poetry works, these little literary devices. There are three cycles, almost perfectly uh, linked in content where Job has three friends and the three friends approach Job with some sort of monologue, some sort of um, uh, conversation to Job. You know, this trying to figure out why Job is suffering. And is, that's not OK. <laughs> I learned not to say Mrs. Holcomb uh, at Rumford. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Holcomb. Uh, Oh, uh, we are all getting wise this year, aren't we? Um, so anyway, so what we have for the bulk of these chapters is we have these three cycles. Okay, Job is, is suffering. He's depressed. Um, he loses his patience very early, right in the first of the narrative when his wife says, you should, you know, you should um, uh, speak out against God. You should turn from God. And, he, and the first thing he says is, no, I couldn't do that. And so we think, oh, wow, that is a righteous God. But almost immediately he turns from that to, 
Oh, God, you must not care for me. Why do you do that? Restore. I wish I had never been born. And he really starts to turn from that sort of strength without ever denying God. That's the key. He never lost his, he never lost his acceptance of who God was. He just learned a big lesson. But anyway, so three friends. The first one approaches him and says, well, I know why you're suffering. Because you must have done something bad. And he tells them all of this. And the next friend comes up and he says, yes, that's exactly right. In fact, here's what you must have done. Uh, you must have done this and this and this. Are you sure? You better check your heart. And the third friend comes up and, and says something. And then, then Job speaks. And through these cycles, he starts to sort of fall in line with their way of thinking. I must. What did I do, God? Oh, my goodness. How could you? And they do this three times. This is the cycle of wisdom. This is kind of how that literature works. And then toward the end of this, we have a fourth friend who interestingly at the very end, he's the only one in the whole book that God doesn't reprimand. He's the only one in the entire book that God doesn't rebuke. His name is uh, Elihu. Elihu. I've said it all kinds of different ways over my life. But uh, Elihu um, is this fourth friend. And he enters in after these cycles and he says, okay, I've been watching all this happen. I've been sitting back here just taking in the way that your so-called friends are giving you advice. And I've been sitting back here watching how you're receiving that advice and then blaming God. Um, let, me, let me tell you that God cannot be mocked. And let me tell your friends that, you know, this sense of retribution theology is not of God. So basically, you're all wrong. <laughs> He wasn't necessarily wrong, but he gives his peace, okay? And then, uh, in essence, all five of these characters are professing wisdom to this point. All five of them are saying, this is what wisdom is, okay? The three friends, Job, Elihu, is, they're all saying, okay, we know wisdom and we have now shared it with you. And then... Oh, this is so good. This is going to be next week. But in chapter 39, God speaks. And it is the most beautiful uh, sort of, um, it's not the narrative. It's the actual word of God that he is sharing and showing Job uh, both visually but also uh, spiritually and theologically. And, and that's what we're going to look at next week. But this is just sort of the overview of the book. That's where our real lessons are learned. I've said this before. When I encourage someone, I'll say, hey, you know, I love Job. I, you know, over and over. I could read it all the time. And they'll look and they'll go, whoo, that's going to be 42 chapters. And that's the Old Testament. And it's what's these friends back and forth. I got to about chapter four and I'm about done. And what I'll tell you is that if you understand chapter one and two, and then you just kind of know what's going on in the middle, just go from one and two to chapter 39. That's, I, I'd encourage you to read it all. Don't, you know, don't hear me. I'm not saying skip necessarily, but if you're short on time, if you're short on attention span, um, just go to where God starts to speak and the whole thing just comes to life. Okay. So that's, that's the overview of Job. What you guys did in your seek and search tonight is within those first few passages or those first 30 chapters. I mean, chapter 28 is, again, one that really speaks to me. I think it is perhaps and I don't want to overuse this word. I think 28 is perhaps the most beautiful chapter in the entire Bible. Doesn't compare with when we see what, what, what Jesus does on the cross as far as ultimate beauty. But as far as just artistic, creative beauty, Job 28 is, is one, of the, one of the most beautiful. Uh, it is where we find the first indication of the purpose of that book. You can go for 27 chapters and still kind of be thinking, hmm, I wonder what happened to Job. I wonder why, why this happened to Job. I wonder why this happened to Job. You get to 28, and I'm going to read it here in a second. You get to 28 and you go, oh, this may not really be about Job. Hmm. This may be about learning something far bigger than that. And so that's our first indication. Chapter 39, 40, 41, that's our final indication. That's where God just seals it and we walk away going, oh, now, yeah, I do know what this book's about. Um, 28 was a glimpse. The rest of these final chapters really tell me. Okay, so uh, the, the actual sort of thesis statement of this, this part up to, to 28 in, in chapter 28 is 
So, so where is wisdom? All of these friends and Job, and they're, they're all speaking wisdom, but, but where is it really? Where, where does wisdom really come from? Now, you guys have uh, an advantage because the first several weeks, we kind of defined where, where wisdom comes from scripturally as well. And I think you're going to see this repeated when I read this. But what it's doing is, is, is setting the stage for God's wisdom to be trusted. Okay, that's really the ultimate purpose. And if we can get through Job and we can truly take it in and we can receive it as, as um, God's uh, instruction for us to truly trust him, then what, what we're doing is like Job, we, we can then walk through our sufferings in this world without having to question God. Not that he doesn't want our questions. But the way that Job ends up questioning God, he doesn't want that. He wants us to be reminded of who he is and who we are. And that's what we're going to get to at the end next week. Okay. But right now, um, Job 28. Can I read it for you guys? Is that okay? Surely there is a mine for silver and a place where they refine gold. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from rock. Man puts an end to darkness, and to the farthest limit he searches out, the rock in gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. They hang and they swing to and fro far from men. The earth from it comes food, and underneath it is turned up as fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires, and its dust contains gold. The path no bird of prey knows, nor has the falcon's eye caught sight of it. The proud beasts have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the base. He hews out channels through the rocks, and his eyes see, see anything precious. He dams up the streams from flowing, and what is hidden he brings out to the light. First 11 verses, Job is saying, in, in kind of contemplating this, he's saying, wow, we look all over. We go to the deepest depths. We go to places that animals and birds can't even go. We go to where the elements of the earth are in the dark. After that, he says, but where can wisdom be found? All these precious metals, are, they're deep hidden. But where's wisdom when you really need it? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value. Nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me. The sea says, it's not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, its precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned, and the acquisition of wisdom is above that of pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living, concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and death say, with our ears, we have heard a report of it. And God understands its way and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth. He sees everything under heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and melted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and he declared it. He established it and also searched it out. And to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. I just love that. I don't know if that resonates with you like it resonates with me, but at the end of the day, just all these places, we find ourselves asking that same question. We find our ask, you know, our, ourself asking, uh, you know, when we're seeking discernment or uncertainty or worries or all of the questions of why and how and what, and we try to find it in all these places. We'll dig the deepest minds to try to find the answers. And at the end of the day, God's saying, okay, Start by knowing that true wisdom is the fear of me. Week one, we talked about that not being fearful of God, right? But being knowledgeable of God. W walking with God. Trusting 
in God. And so it's in chapter 28 that Job's starting to have this reflection of all the ways he's been searching out wisdom in this. And he, he's reminded that in this despair, God is still telling us, hey, of all these places, it's, it's the fear of the Lord to shun evil. That's wisdom and understanding. Okay? So that's, that's all going to fit into this, this conclusion that is really, um, it's interesting when God starts to speak. It takes us on this tour and, and it's just, just really beautiful. So Job 28 um, we're not going to have time for this, but in the, um, the email tomorrow, and probably if I was able to put this online, I'll put a link to this. This again is the Bible project. And this is unlike the ones that are animated. Like we looked at Samson or Solomon and poetry. The, this is the one where they do all their, you know, they tell the story as they're drawing it. It's wonderful. It's like nine minutes or something, 10 minutes. So I'll send you that link. It just will give you another overview of Job from a different perspective. Get you ready for, um, for next week when we, we dig into this really exciting part uh, up here, which uh, these guys call the virtual tour of the universe. And then uh, you guys are going to help um, artistically create that at your tables. That's a lot of fun. So any, uh, <laughs> any, any thoughts on that before we do the final slide? Oh, oh, why it's unique to the Bible itself. So it's set in us, the beginning of the book in the land of us lived a man. Uh, it's beautiful. First line. Uh, and that, so that's he, he's not Jewish. Job is not Jewish. That makes it unique, particularly in the Hebrew scriptures. So this is far off land of us. Um, all of the characters are non Israelites. OK, and uh, there's there's no clear historical setting, which makes Job a really interesting um, sort of Bible student. Uh, project and research uh, is, is Job. Many believe, and after my time in it, I believe Job is probably chronologically in terms of recorded, not the information in it, but as far as recorded books of the Bible, Job's the oldest. And so that makes it unique as well. Uh, the author wants us to focus on the questions raised by jo Job's suffering. That's, that's the... Um, that's the objective. That's the objective of this wisdom literature is um, don't get too caught up in the storyline of Job, but, uh, but get caught up in the questions that he's asking and the questions that, that really all humanity has in similar situations. And um, we're going to see uh, next week. I'll just, I just love uh, it's, I mean, when God speaks again, this is why we think of oh, the patience of Job. He's such a good guy, but he had turned so far kind of in these shaking fist at God, that God's response, his first line out of the box is Job, put your big boy pants on face me like a man. <sighs> and imagine God's voice saying that, not mine. <laughs> Woo! And, uh, we go from there. And by the end of that, Job is praising God like he never has. He is repenting and asking forgiveness. And um, that's where we go from there. But uh, yeah, God's re response really tells us what our posture towards suffering should be. Okay. Need to know. Race sponsorships. If, um, if you work for someone, if you have business, if you wanted to share the race sponsorships, um, they're online where you can get the actual uh, PDF and send it. Uh, you can do it at the race registration. Uh, Rebecca Kearns handles our race sponsorships. And so she will also work with you and get it in various levels. And we like to recognize our sponsors. Uh, when I talk about the race, in a few weeks, I'll talk about the dynamics of the race itself and the mechanics of it. In short, because we try to keep this race to be family friendly as possible, a lot of 5Ks start at 25, 30 bucks and go up. We start at 20 and stay there a long time. We basically cover our costs with our registration fees. And we bank on a lot of the sponsorships to actually uh, make up the funding to City Lights, to uh, whoever our beneficiary is. So sponsorships are always appreciated. Race registration is live. I've talked about that. Not you guys, though. Uh, door prize winners tonight. You know what? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double them up next week. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to double up next week, so we'd have to time. Um, and in the next week, injuries, animal portraits. Joe, put your big boy pants on. You can think about that all week while you're running. All right. Any last questions before we go? Thank you guys for coming. This sure makes it a lot more fun for me. 
I hope for you too when you're here. Trust me. It's pretty lonely when you're not. So uh, let, me, uh, let me pray for us and uh, we'll go. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the gift of health and mobility. And we thank you for the gift of this day. We pray that we have honored you, uh, that we have pleased you in our words and our thoughts and our actions. And may we do so through the rest of this week. Uh, Lord, may we contemplate on your word uh, and may we just continue to chew on the idea, Lord, that you are the source of all wisdom. And in those areas that we need wisdom, Lord, that we're seeking answers and discernment, uh, we ask your clarity in that. We ask you to, to share it with us, to, to be clear with us, and we lay it before you. And until we meet again, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.